Open your Bibles this morning to the book of Romans, please. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 1. Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, every one of you who judges is without excuse. But when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the same thing. We know that God's judgment on those who do such things is based on the truth. Do you really think any one of you who judges those who do such things yet do the same that you will escape God's judgment? Or do you despise the riches of His kindness, restraint, and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Because of your hardened and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves in the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed. He will repay each one according to his works. Eternal life to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality. The wrath and anger for those who are self-seeking and disobey the truth while observing unrighteousness. There will be affliction and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew and also to the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does what is good, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. For there is no favoritism with God. All who sin without the law will also perish without the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For the hearers of the law are not righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. So when Gentiles who do, who do not by nature have the law do what the law demands, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. Their consciences confirm this. Their competing thoughts either excuse or accuse or even excuse them on the day when God judges what people have kept secret according to my gospel through Christ Jesus. Now if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God, Chris, can you turn that down for just a little bit? I'm getting some feedback and I'm finding it distracting. Thank you. Now if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are superior being destructive from the law, thank you very much. And if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light to those in darkness, an instructor of the ignorant, a teacher of the immature, having the embodiment of knowledge and truth in the law, you then who teach another, don't you teach yourself? You who preach, you must not steal, do you steal? You who say you must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who detest idols, do you rob their temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Circumcision benefits you if you observe the law, but if you are a lawbreaker, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So if an uncircumcised man keeps the law's requirements, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? A man who is physically uncircumcised but who keeps the law will judge you who are a lawbreaker in spite of having the letter of the law in circumcision. For a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly and true circumcision is not something visible in the flesh. On the contrary, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is of the heart. By the spirit, not the letter, that person's praise is not from people but from God. Let us pray. Lord, there's an awful lot uh, in this chapter. And, and it can be confusing, and sometimes it's hard to see how it actually applies to us. Uh, help me as I unpack what is here. Um, Lord, help us to understand. Help us to see how it applies to our life. Lord, please give me the words to say. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Last week, we sought to address the question, what happened to America? What happened to my country? I believe most of us can admit that the second part of Romans 1 is a pretty fair description of what America looks like today. Look there again, if you will, please. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. 
And because they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, God delivered them over to a corrupt mind so that they do what is not right. They are filled with all unrighteousness, evil, greed, and wickedness. They are full of envy, murder, quarrels, deceit, and malice. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, senseless, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. I think that is a pretty fair description of our country, especially if you include the preceding paragraph. And I find comfort in the fact that all through this passage, Paul keeps saying they, and they did this, and they did that. But then we get to chapter 2 and verse 1, and Paul changes from they to you. We need to remember that when Paul wrote this letter, there were no chapter divisions. This letter was not broken up into verses. It was one long letter like people used to write one another. I think many of us can sit in the stands and cheer Paul on as he describes what those people are doing and what's coming for them. Paul says they did all of this. And then in verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, so you are without excuse. Paul, wait a minute. I don't like how you have changed the pronouns that you're using. I, I was happy and I was cheering you on when you said they, they, they. But now you say you are without excuse. I'm not comfortable. And God stops talking about them people. And he starts talking about me. Paul said, they did all of this so you, or he's speaking to me, they did all of this so you, Gene, are without excuse. Because you sit and judge them. Gene, you have done the very things they are doing. I think a lot of us good moral religious people are surprised to find that God does not think as highly of us as we sometimes think of ourselves. Yeah, Gene, they have done all of this. So you are without excuse because you judged them. And I start sputtering and stumbling over my words as I try to come up with excuses for my mistakes. I say, Lord, I'm not like them and he answers gene how did i describe them in romans 1 29 i called them gossips have you ever done that well yes but as a matter of fact gene sometimes you still do and you just disguise it as a prayer request how duplicitous is that and Gene, I, I called them slanderers. People who say things to intentionally harm the, the character or the reputation or to hurt another person. Have you ever done that? Well, yes, but when I do it, it's different. I called them arrogant and boastful. Have you ever been like that? Yes, sir, and, some, and sometimes I still am. I said they disobeyed their parents. Were you ever like that? Yes, sir, many times. Then what makes you different than them? I cannot say what you are like. I can only use myself as an example. As a practiced and self-righteous hypocrite, I find it a bit disconcerting when God holds a mirror. Up to me too close. Why is it that we are so angered by other people's sins while excusing our own? I believe there are several reasons. One, I believe that we are often blind to our own faults. We live in an age when people claim they need to be true to themselves. True to yourself, what does that even mean? 
In Jeremiah 17, 9, we read, The heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? No, I'm often blind to my own faults. Faults that others can see. Gladys reminded me this morning, that's why God gives us wives. <laughs> I stand before you this morning as a drug smuggler. Uncaught, unconvicted, but a drug smuggler nonetheless. Mark and Bindu are visiting Niagara Falls, which reminded me of something that happened to us a number of years ago. Several years ago, Gladys, Drew, and I, we borrowed Jack and Orlea's pop-up camper. We went on a vacation up the East Coast, and we came over and saw Niagara Falls and came down to the Creation Museum and hit Cedar Falls and all of the roller coasters. On the way on our trip, there were two girls and a German Shepherd on the side of the road hitchhiking. If I remember correctly, it was the German Shepherd holding out his thumb. Two girls and a German Shepherd hitchhiking on the side of the road. We stopped and picked them up, but the cab of the truck was full. There was no room for them. We told them they'd have to get in the back of the truck, and we gave them a blanket and a tarp to cover themselves with. As I remember, they rode with us some 500 miles or more as we were traveling on our trip. A couple days later, we crossed the Canadian border to see Niagara Falls from the Canadian side. And after we got back, I was cleaning up and rearranging things in the bed of the truck when I found a, a joint, a marijuana cigarette in the bed of the truck. And I did what many of y'all would do. Drew, come here! <laughs> Drew came, I said, what is this and how did it get there? And had a little boy standing there looking lost. Daddy, I don't know. I don't have any idea. And then we got to remembering back and thinking back and figured those two girls probably dark, dropped it and in the darkness of the back of the truck were unable to find it. Sure, I'm glad that those uh, customs agents who inspected my truck on the way there and back didn't bring out the dog would be hard to explain. Carrying around contraband I didn't even know was there. Blind to a crime I was unknowingly committing. And how many of us have critical judgmental spirits we do not see in ourselves? How many of us are proud or gossip? And don't even recognize those things in ourselves. I'm blind to my own faults. Sometimes we try to forget the things that we have done wrong. You remember when King David slept with his neighbor's wife and got her pregnant and then had her husband killed to cover up what he had done? And then David married that then widow woman and went on with life as though nothing had happened? God was not happy. In 2 Samuel chapter 12 we read, So the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he arrived, he said to him, There were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very large flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one small ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised her and she grew up with him and with his children. From his meager food she would eat from his cup she would drink, and in his arms he would sleep. She was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man could not bring himself to take one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for his guest. David was infuriated with the man and said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. Because he has done this thing and shown no pity, he must pay four times for that lamb. David was angry that a man with many sheep stole the one sheep that a poor man had. He completely forgot what he had just done. So the Bible goes on, Nathan replied to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord God of Israel says, I anointed you king over Israel and I rescued you from Saul. I gave you your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that was not enough, I would have given you even more. Why then have you despised the Lord's command by doing what I considered evil? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and took his wife as your own wife. 
You murdered him with the Amorite sword. Now therefore the sword will never leave your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own wife. Sometimes we gloss over. We forget the things we have done. And so we think perhaps God will as well. And third, I think sometimes we forget that God uses a different standard than we do. For example, let's take our thought life. Much of this passage must be understood in the light of our Lord's revelation in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, God who looks at the heart sees what's going on in the inner attitude and judges on that basis. He doesn't judge as men judge according to what is observable from the outward life. In the Sermon on the Mount, we learn that if we hold a feeling of animosity and hatred towards someone, if we are bitter and resentful and filled with malice toward an individual, then we are guilty of murder, just as though we had taken a knife and plunged it into that person's chest or shot him with a gun. If we find ourselves lustfully longing to possess the body of another, if we play with this idea over and over in our minds and treat ourselves to a fantasy of sex, we have committed fornication or adultery. If we find ourselves filled with pride, yet we put on the appearance of being humble and considerate of others, we are guilty of the worst of sins, pride of heart, which destroys humility. We think these things will go unnoticed, but God sees them in our hearts. He sees all the actions that we conveniently have forgotten. He sees when we cut people down or speak with spite and sharpness and deliberately try to hurt them. He sees it when we are unfair in our business tactics, when we are arrogant towards someone we think is on a lower social level than ourselves. He sees it when we are stubborn and uncooperative in trying to work out a tense situation. All these things God takes note of. We who condemn these actions and others find ourselves guilty of the same thing. Isn't it remarkable that when others mistreat us, we always think it is most serious and requires immediate correction. But when we mistreat others, we say to them, you're making so much out of such a little thing. Why, it's so trivial and insignificant. We ignore our own sins because we're often blind to our own sins. Try to forget what we have done wrong. We forget that God uses a standard different than we do. And fourth, we rename our sins. Other people lie and cheat. We simply stretch the truth a little bit. Other people betray. We're simply protecting our rights. Others steal. We borrow. Others have prejudices. We have convictions. Others murder and kill. We exploit and ruin. We are simply being truthful. We cry, those people ought to be stoned. And Jesus said, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. We are all guilty of the same things we are accusing other people of doing. Well, how do the unrighteous respond when by the power of the holy spirit eyes are opened or conviction comes notice how the unrighteous respond look there again if you will please romans chapter 2 and verse 2 we know that god's judgment on those who do such things is based on the truth do you really think any one of you who judges those who do such things yet do the same that you will escape god's judgment or do you despise the riches of His kindness, restraint, and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? How do the unrighteous respond when they finally realize that they're living just like other folks? Well, they pour contempt on God's grace. Yeah, I admit that I'm not as good as I should be. I admit that there's room for improvement in my life, but God understands His grace is sufficient. Yeah, I know I'm not where I should be. I know I'm not walking with the Lord like I should be. 
I know I'm not with God's people like I should be, but God is gracious. He is merciful. He'll understand. These people show contempt for God's grace. Yeah, I know my salvation costs Jesus a lot, but I'm sure he understands that I'm only human. Nobody's perfect. I was reading an article a while back written by a teacher in the inner city of Orlando. She told the story of a young boy in her class who wasn't doing well at school. So she was trying to figure out what the problem was, and she talked to him a number of times trying to figure it out, and she finally determined that the boy didn't have a refrigerator at his house, and so he was often hungry. She and some of the other teachers at the school chipped in together and bought the family a refrigerator and delivered it to the boy's home. And for a couple of weeks, Things were good, and the boy was doing better. They had a place where they could place the refrigerated food, and he was not going hungry as he was. And then the boy missed school for a week. And when he came back, she asked where he had been. He said his parents had sold the refrigerator, and they had used the money to take a trip to visit relatives. What kind of thinking is that? And what kind of thinking is it that acknowledges the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the grace and mercy of a heavenly Father and then says, thank you, but I'll take what you gave me and live like the world. There'll be no effort, no sacrifice, no struggle on my part. God, I'm just counting on your grace. How sickening is that? The unrighteous respond by pouring contempt on God's grace. The unrighteous respond by storing up wrath. Look there again, if you will, please, in chapter 2 and verse 5. Because of your hardened and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves in the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment is revealed. He will repay each one according to his works, Eternal life to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality. But wrath and anger to those who are self-seeking and disobey the truth while obeying unrighteousness. There will be affliction and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does what is good, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. For there is no favoritism with God. Those who realize where they are and what God has done for them and continue to allow that disobedience and rebellion in their life, Paul says, they are storing up wrath for themselves. C.S. Lewis says it like this. People often think of Christian morality as a kind of bargain in which God says, <clears throat> if you keep a lot of rules, I'll reward you, and if you don't, I'll do the other thing. I do not think that's the best way of looking at it. I would much rather say that every time you make a choice, you are turning the central part of you, the part that chooses, into something a little different than it was before. And by taking your life as a whole with all of your innumerable choices, all your lifelong uh, creature, uh, all, all your lifelong, you are slowly turning this central thing either into a heavenly creature or into a hellish creature. Either into a creature that is in harmony with God and with other creatures and with itself or else into one that is in a state of war and hatred with God and with its fellow creatures and with itself. To be the one kind of creature is heavenly. It is joy and peace and knowledge and power. To be the other means madness, horror, idiocy, rage, impotence and eternal loneliness. Each of us at each moment is progressing to the one state or the other. Each day with the choices we make, with the decisions we make, with the actions we make, with the way we decide to spend our life, we're either becoming more like Christ or less like Him. We're either building more joy and fullness into our lives or less. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, Sow a thought and you reap an action. Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap the character. Sow a character and you reap... A destiny. Paul says it this way in Galatians chapter 6. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. 
Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh, flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. They are like this. But this is the issue I have with you. The unrighteous respond by making excuses and taking God's grace for granted. But how do we respond? Look there again, if you will, please. Romans chapter 2 and verse 6. He will repay each according to his works. Eternal life to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality. But wrath and anger to those who are self-seeking and disobey the truth while obeying unrighteousness. There will be affliction and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does what is good, first to the Jew and also to the Greek, for there is no favoritism with God. How do God's people respond? First, we make a decision. God has laid out two paths before you, the way of the path of compromise and defeat or the path of obedience and victory. Decide what kind of life you want in this life and in the life to come. If you are happy with where and what you are, then do nothing. You can drift into defeat. It takes no effort to do that. All of the world does that. But if you want to live the victorious overcoming life, then after making a decision to walk with God obediently, then ask for help. In Psalm 139, beginning in verse 23, David says, Lord, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. This verse, David asked God two things. He says, first, Lord, search me. David realizes that he cannot understand everything in his heart. He is unaware of all of the areas of compromise in his life. He says, Lord, you know my true motivations. You know what my heart is really like. You know what sin is lurking in the dark recesses of my heart. God, search me and make me aware of those things. And second, he asked the Lord to lead him. David says, Lord, when I become aware of the failings in my life, I want you to help me clean those things out to make them right. It reminds me of a song we used to sing years ago when I was a youth pastor. It says, I don't want to be, I don't want to be a casual Christian. I don't want to live, I don't want to live a lukewarm life. So let me light up the night with an everlasting light. I don't want to live the casual Christian life. How do we respond? We make a decision. Either I'm going to walk the straight and narrow or I'm going to walk in the world. And those two paths were not parallel. There is one or the other. You make a decision. The second, you ask for help. Lord, show me and help me. And third, you follow through. Look there again, if you will, please. Romans chapter 2, verse 17. Romans chapter 2, verse 17. Now, if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know His will and approve the things that are superior being instructed from the law, and if you are convinced that you are a God for the blind, a light to those in darkness, an instructor of the ignorant, a teacher of the immature, having the embodiment of knowledge and truth in the law, you then who teach another, don't you teach yourself? You who preach, you must not steal. Do you steal? You who say you must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who detest Idols, do you rob their temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? For as it is written, the name of the Lord is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Circumcision benefits you if you observe the law. But if you are a lawbreaker, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Drop down to verse 28. For a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, and true circumcision is not something visible in the flesh. On the contrary, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart, by the Spirit, not the letter. That person's praise is not from people, but from God. Paul is speaking to the Jews and using circumcision as an illustration. He said, it's not enough what you do on the outside. It's not enough that you don't curse like you used to, or you don't insult people like you used to, or, or you have learned a little bit of church language. Paul says it's not enough cleaning up the outside. 
He says what really matters is on the inside. Remember when Jesus confronted the Pharisees? Oh, most of Israel looked up to them and considered them highly and devout and devoted, righteous, religious people. And Jesus said, you're nothing more than whitewashed tombs. On the outside, you're cleaned up and looking good, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. And by the way, those people who say that Christians would not be offensive, Jesus was often offensive. When you speak the truth, people are going to say you're offensive. But when Jesus spoke the truth, he did it in love. You follow through on what you're saying. Follow through with your commitment. And fourth, Enjoy fellowship with God. Look again, if you will, please, in verse 29. The last sentence of verse 29. That person's praise is not from people, but from God. Oh, my friends, can you imagine standing before the Lord and standing before the devil? As the devil once stood before God, and God went to bragging on his man Job. He said, How about my man Job? Oh, can you imagine when the devil comes to present himself before God and God says, Oh, have you seen my man? Have you seen my woman? Have you seen how they have sold out to me? Have you seen how their life has changed? Have you seen how their priorities are different? They're no longer content with just dressing up the outside for the people at church. They're working on the inside because they want me to be pleased. Oh, what a joy it'll be to one day be able to enter the halls of heaven and hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servants. But my friend, I can't do it for you and you can't do it for me. There's a choice that must be taken. Y'all remember the poem written years ago by Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood and sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it been in the undergrowth. Then took the other as far as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Some were ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Let us pray. Lord, it's easy to cheer on when we read in your word the sins of the world. And it's easy to say, look at those people. But Lord, it's not near as comfortable when you hold the mirror of your word up in front of us. And we are forced to see the compromise and the disobedience in our own lives. Lord, you want to use clean and pure vessels people sold out to you. Father God, help us to be such a people. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.